What are the principles that you've lived by that allowed you to go from dropping out of high school, broke, selling flowers by the side of the road to a net worth of $150 million? For me, it all comes down to this single decision I made to drop out of high school when I was 16 years old. I grew up in Queens, New York, uh, very poor, uh, living on government cheese and taking care of uh, my mother, who was obese, which I don't talk a ton a lot, but was very heavy and the byproduct of dysfunction and abuse, which only became clear later on. So just born into dysfunction and uh, everything was about concealment. Everything in my early days was about making sure that nobody knew just how poor I was, just how desperate I was. So there's all this concealment was what I was born into. It takes a long time to sort of shed that shame. But and then after years and years of realizing the cavalry wasn't coming, I had an epiphany and it was actually uh, born of watching my mother. She took her GD as an adult and went from having no education to enrolling in Queens College. And she had a really fierce mind. And uh, for her, education was about um, dignity. But as a kid who was around 13, 14, I'm like, wait a second. I saw an ad in a local penny saver newspaper and it said, uh, you know, deliver flyers for a congressman, uh, you know, college students only, but you'd make eight bucks an hour. At the time I was scraping gum at McDonald's, making 375 or working in a deli overnight. And I was like, what is it about this mythical college student thing that makes you make twice as much income? I was like, I want to be a college student. <laughs> and I had a thought, why don't I do what my mother did by accident, but do it on purpose? Why don't I drop out of high school? And when I excitedly told my guidance counselor this plan, like, I got to figure it out, Mr. Barkin. I'm going to drop out of high school, get my GD, and enroll in Queens College at 16. And he and, thought you were a moron, I assume. Yeah, I thought I, I, a moron. This Why is, weren't you, though? Because that, like, if somebody came to me and said, hey, Tom, I'm thinking about dropping out of high school, getting my GED, even knowing your story, I'd be like, that's a bad move. Right. So <laughs> what's the principle that made that a good move for you? Is it the burn the boats idea? Or no. is it something else? I think else? the burn the boats is the way, is the way I, I stayed, stayed the course. The principle is that um, conve conventional thinking is built for the average story, the mm -hmm. regression to the mean, right? Whatever works for most people. Our education system works for most people when you have maybe two parents or at least one functioning parent, right? But, but the world is set up for the average situation. And when you are in, in an outlier situation, right, you need to take matters into your own hands. That was mm -hmm. number one. And the second principle is trust your instincts. Don't outsource your judgment. Mr. Barkin and everybody else thought it was absolutely crazy. Uh, and they were right to think it was crazy. But they didn't have the full context of my life because I was concealing everything. Mm -hmm. When when I presented to Mr. Barkin and the other people at school, they saw a kid who was pretty well polished wearing Jordache jeans back then. And um, But they didn't have the full context. So the, the principle that I am the greatest undisputed expert they'll ever be about myself, holds true to this day. Mm. And we tend to look for confirmation from experts, confirmation from books on Barnes & Noble or TED Talks, instead of first consulting yourself. And my instincts told me that, that if your mother's dying in the room next door and you are thinking about crashing your car into a tree half the time, you know, as time went on, that this decision makes perfect sense but no one will ever understand because they don't have the context. I think instincts are trained in Agreed. most people, and if you train them poorly, you're in real trouble. If I had steered by my instincts, I think I would have really led myself astray a lot of times in my life. And so I, I am curious why at 16, had you developed self-awareness? Were you processing through it the way that you just explained it? Or... Like, how do you think about that? Because I've seen more people go wrong on their instincts than I've seen go right. And I think we could debate, is there a difference between the word instinct and intuition? Intuition is probably more of a proxy for pattern recognition, I would think, at the end of the day. But whether we call it instincts or, or intuition, I do think there's a difference between what our instincts are telling us in a non-crisis situation mm. and what our instincts tell us in a crisis situation. I think we are, are, are all hardwired to survive. And when survival is on the line, which at that time, survival really was on the line, not just myself, but my mother, I think our instincts or our intuition are a strong guide. Mm. Now, normally, agreed, If I is instinct a word for impulse? Yeah, very different thing. <laughs> if I relied on my impulses, which sometimes mm. I do, they lead me astray. That's interesting. How do you tease those two apart? You know you're relying on instincts when you're in a crisis situation, but two, when, there, when no other option makes any sense. Like when you have that clarity, I had such clarity that... One, my intuition or instincts told me my mother was going to die eventually. She was going to succumb both to her depression, but her obesity, right? 
my instincts also told me that I was going to spend the rest of my life resenting her if I didn't take matters into my own hands, that there was no institution that was going to help us. And that the four years I had to spend at, at high school was too much time to waste, right? I have to ascribe those to instincts because it wasn't on the internet. It wasn't from counseling or experts. It was bubbling up, but it all bubbled up from the crisis situation of recognizing that it's either do or, it's a do or die moment. Harder to replicate that clarity when we're not in a crisis. As an entrepreneur, as an investor that vets entrepreneurs, talk to me about the moment where you realize nobody's coming to save you. That's a principle for me that if I were going to say, okay, there's a small handful of things that led to my success, one of them is that I take responsibility for everything. It's all my fault. If I never point one finger at anybody without pointing all 10 at myself first, um, what, what, how, how, what do you look for in people? How do you get them to take responsibility? Why should they take responsibility? We're in a moment now where that's very unfashionable. It's such a great point. Oh, well, I'll take you back in time to a conversation I had sitting at the table with uh, my mother, right? Um, again, uh, dealing with all these different health issues and our relationship dynamic was upside down. I was parentified as a young child and anyone out there who's a caregiver knows what I'm talking about. And when you're a caregiver, you're both anointed the caregiver in a way you didn't, uh, you didn't want, but you're also led to believe that uh, you are a savior. Right, that you were born to do that. That was m- that was my Whoa. situation. That yeah, that that I was I was groomed is the wrong word because it sounds negative, but that I, I was anointed as the caregiver and the savior, and that became a lot of my identity. But my poor mother at the time was always grappling with depression and her weight, and she wouldn't take matters into her own hands. She would. I never talked about this before. Uh, So she would, uh, she would never get surgery for her knees. And I would say, if you don't get surgery, like you're going to die. You can't, you know, you can't, you can't move. And uh, I remember this conversation where I would say, what's a better way to approach this life? Cause she would say, you don't know what it's like to be dying. I'm like, well, I don't know if, I don't think you have to be dying. I think you can get your, your knees replaced and do something. And then uh, I remember saying to her, I had this epiphany. I'm no longer going to view the world as things happen to me. I would rather see the world as I happen to things. But I also had enough awareness and defiance and oppositional behavior to say, this is unnatural and it's going to lead to bad things. If I don't speak up, right, it's going to take decades of therapy instead of just years (laughs) to unravel this. So it was in the context of me trying to reframe her thinking of saying, what's better? Should I see myself as a victim or should I see myself as an agent in my own rescue? So there's a point of saying that, don't mean to get emotional, but uh, it's all still very raw, is that um, that is the actual truth of the universe, that we happen to things, that we get the last word until our last breath. It's like a man's search for meaning, right? That and, Such a good and so when I say to you instincts, I agree. I normally roll my eyes when people say trust your instincts without nuance. But like, where did that come from? That was instinctive. And it's only because the situation was so desperate that I instinctively realized the relationship is upside down. It's going to leave me with lots of scars. But two, you're viewing the world as if you have no agency and no power. And that does not ring true to me deep down you know, in my DNA. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important principles for anybody watching this, hoping to understand how to move forward. If they disregard that moment, they're never going to make it. And this is the thing that drives me crazy. We were also talking about this before we started rolling. So long before I had a show, I had a thousand employees that grew up hard as hell in the inner cities. And I had this like moment of, oh my God, I can help you. This is crazy. Like I was meant for this moment. I'm like, I have cobbled together, like you, so I took myself from scrounging in my couch cushions to find enough change to put gas in my car to selling a company for a billion dollars. Like, even I, like, I get the chills now when I think that's not a story that actually happened. Do you even feel that way, brother? Sometimes I'm like, I think I'm making it up. I, <laughs> right? I like, more do you feel, feel disassociated? So, yes. Yes. Because I've said it so many times yes. that I'll forget. It's not a catchy phrase. I actually was like, fuck, I don't have enough money to go. It was for a job interview. I don't have enough money to put gas in my car to go to this job interview. What am I going to do? I was like, oh shit. Like there might be change. (laughs) Now, admittedly, gas prices were a lot lower than they are now. So I could actually get enough gas money. But when I look back and I go, okay, wait, I've never felt special. I've never thought like, oh, I'm better than other people. In fact, my story is the exact opposite. I always felt like Solieri from... um, Amadeus, the movie. So real, real guy, 
And he was a contemporary of Mozart. And he, in the movie anyway, he laments to God, God, why did you make me just good enough to realize I'll never be as good as Mozart? And I heard that at 16 and was like, oh my God, that sums up my whole life. Why did you make me just smart enough to realize I'll never be as smart as my friends or I'll never be as smart as the next business guy, whatever. And so when I end up overcoming that and I realize, oh, it's just skill acquisition, I start just going crazy, gobbling up skills, spending an obscene amount of time pushing myself, reading, researching, all that. So anyway, I end up getting good. I'm in front of these employees and I'm like, oh my God, like these ideas that I've cobbled together, they will work for you. But what I didn't realize at the time is 98%, obviously that's a rough number, just they're never gonna point all 10 fingers at themselves. They're never gonna do the work. Like they, they, they don't have what I call the only belief that matters. The only belief that matters is if you put time and energy into getting better at something, you will actually get better. And if that is true to your mom, to you, to me, to everybody, it's like, oh, I can address my knees and I can actually get moving and I could lose weight and my life could be different. Oh, I could go to college and end up teaching at Harvard, which is crazy <laughs> if people don't know that part of your story. My question is like, you have lived the thing that wounds me the deepest, which is that the, there are people that I love an unimaginable amount and they won't do anything with the ideas and I'm watching them do a slower version of what you watched your mom do. Mm. How do you deal with that? Because that really messes with me. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, this book is my attempt to make the case that it is possible that like you just said, I'm not extraordinary. I was in extraordinary circumstances and sort of, and was able to open a portal to another world about what happens when you go all in with, with complete surrender. But I have the same feelings you do. The ideas are there. Why don't you do it? You know, why, 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 why won't you just implement it? I think I wrote a book <laughs> to try to achieve it. You should write a book too. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so burn the boats, giving yourself over to your plan A. Talk to me about that because it, so I often tell people I'm not a burn the boats guy. Now I've read your book. So I actually do completely subscribe to the way that you talk about it, but give us the nuanced, make the case, the yes. nuanced case in a nutshell that you make in the books is pretty compelling. Okay, good. All right. No, I love it. The Burn the Boats is a bit of a Trojan horse, right? So, uh, you know, some people who get frustrated and they pick it up, they expect a certain thing and it's totally another. As you pointed out, it's not the bombastic. It's not called Burn the Boats with you in it, or it's not called Burn the Boats to hell with everyone else. This book is written for the 48% of people, if you went on a train platform, this is actually true from a study, and said, do you have a plan A? 48% would say yes. The other, you know, 40% are lying. Most people do, right? This book is written for the angst-ridden, anxiety-laden, risk-adverse people who I believe need it more than anyone else, not the self-possessed. So the nuance of burn the boats, and we all, I don't have to revisit the ancient, you know, theory of we perform best when we have no escape, right? But the, the boat in my book is meant to be a child's uh, boat floating in a bathtub mm. that you set fire to because the metaphorical boats that many of us have to burn begin with childhood and legacy issues, right? I think it is worth telling people where that ancient okay. idea comes from. Okay, all right, let's from. tell it. Okay, so this is actually fascinating. Uh, Cortez in 1519, a lot of people know the Cortez story, very bad man, uh, burned the boats while taking on the Aztecs and was able to uh, win that battle by literally eliminating the boats, the escape route, and eliminating food provisions. I'm more fascinated by, as I started researching this book, that if you go back to the beginning of recorded history, every culture in every century has a fabled military general. And the way they were to overcome insurmountable odds was to literally eliminate their escape, boats in a lot of cases, bridges sometimes, and destroy their food provisions. There's a story in 207 BC, China, same exact thing. They even have a word for it in Chinese for burn the boats. Hmm. Um, and Alexander the Great, Caesar, uh, ancient Israelites. So I was like, why is it that military leaders intuitively understand that we in peacetime in modern day don't accept that the idea, the way to be successful is to actually eliminate choice. So I started looking at the science and said, well, maybe this doesn't hold true in peacetime. Maybe this is an outdated concept. We're too evolved and we don't need to burn the boats anymore. We need to like mend the bridges or something or yeah, whatever it is. And there's a study in 2014 at a Wharton, which is fascinating. They tried to identify what is the insidious impact of not having a plan B, but actually contemplating a plan B. And what they found in this study, the methodology. So you don't have one, but you're just going to think just, about it. Right. So, they give, so they, yeah, they gave permission to the students and said, you know, by the way, if you just want to think of another way to get a snack or whatever the hell it was, right? Like you can think about it. 
And what they found were two interesting things. One, st- they, the, the group that was allowed to just contemplate a plan B was statistically much less likely to be successful. But more importantly, the second part is what I was most interested in. They were less interested in plan A anymore. Hmm. They, had, in, they had lost intrinsic mo- motivation to achieve it. So my book is an attempt to make the case with that data and going back in time. It is 1,000% true that the only way to achieve extraordinary things is if you don't have a plan B. But now we have to get into definitions because this is where the objections come. But Matt, I have to pay the bills. Or I can't afford risk. You're a rich white guy. You know, like you don't understand what it's like. Plan A this is why I say I'm the most paranoid risk taker you'll ever meet. Plan A 1000% contemplates your mitigation strategy for when it might not work out. The difference is you contemplate it at the beginning of the journey. Whenever I do anything hard, I'm sure you do the same thing. I ask myself, what's the worst thing that could happen? Because I catastrophize, going back to my childhood trauma. I, I absolutely I embrace it. What's the worst thing that could happen? What would I do if the worst thing could happen? back to that crisis mentality that we're all wired with, I 100% have within me at this moment the ability to mitigate any big decision I try to make Mm. without even a moment's thought. If I ask the question, get the other job, go back to working for Bill, whatever I gotta do, right? Three, what's the statistical, what's the likelihood that I could forecast that the catastrophizing that I've just thought about is likely to materialize? Usually the answer is infinitesimally small at the end of the day. And then four, and I'll talk about this in the context of Harvard, what wouldn't I do to walk into that classroom as a kid from Queens who had dropped out of high school and teach? Mm-hmm. It like takes my breath away when I think about what I wouldn't do to make this book successful and help people. And the answer is I would come within an inch of my life for most of my, literally, I got COVID, double pneumonia when I, when I did my IPO, 30 days with oscimeters on both fingers. Ooh. Like I would, I would almost die to achieve the things I really care about. Compare that against the low probability that the bad thing's going to happen if plan A doesn't work out. It's so small. So point of saying this is my book is nuanced. It's going to disappoint anybody who wants life to be about, you know, to hell with everybody else. It talks about empathy, self-awareness. And, but the most important point, my boat is a metaphor for the internal and external things that prevent us from, from fully committing. Mm. You were talking about that it's a child's boat. Yeah. And why? I find the greatest arbitrage entirely within our control is self-awareness. Right. And when I'm assessing a leader that I believe under indexes on self-awareness, when I try to identify why, why are they afraid to look within? Why are they, why are one, are they blaming others? Or worse, why do they believe they don't have the power to make change? Or worse, why do they feel not accountable? There's something blocking their willingness to look at themselves. And I find more than not, this could be confirmation bias, that the answer is a legacy issue. I, I'll tell you one fact pattern I find a lot with founders. They're living someone else's life to seek the approval that they can never get. The father who always wanted them to be an entrepreneur or this like this, this elusive approval that they're seeking that they can never get. Maybe they have a partner in the foxhole who is their friend of me, who's pulling them down to earth when they should be releasing them, right? There, there are all these issues. So it's either legacy issues or psychological issues, I find, are the reasons that hold people back from being self-aware. And the hardest ones are those Why childhood ones. Why legacy stop you from being self-aware? Because, like, let's look at mine. You were talking to me about my mother, and within five minutes, I'm, I'm like having, I'm getting emotional, which I regret at this moment. If you're carrying something that, well, let's just call that overall thing shame, because that's where shame prevents you from wanting to be seen. Disclosure, if you have shameful legacy issues or, di- or frustration with yourself, you don't want to face them. And so that makes you not want to be self-aware. You want all the answers to be external and not to be internal. Man, so I know uh, you've said I've debated getting a tattoo for yeah. 40 plus years yeah. of my life. But if I was going to get a tattoo, it would say face everything. Yeah, What do you mean by that? That's, uh, you just mentioned people don't want to face themselves. I wrote my book so I'd read my book. (laughs) It's the number, again, I asterisk the hell out of my life. Like everyone listening, I I think I have a lot of insights. I don't always implement them, which we don't acknowledge at our level. I feel like enough. But the number one answer to everything is face everything. And yet it's, if I had a tattooed on my chest so I would see it in the mirror to remind myself, but it is the number one self-talk that I give. The answer is to face everything. That most of the anxiety that we all carry is anticipation of what would happen if we face something. Mm. Whereas you can make that anxiety go away if you just faced it. That's interesting. So I have a idea, which I think is actually the same idea that I encapsulate as action cures all. Mm. And what I'm trying to get people to understand, all that anxiety, all that worry, it will go away if you start taking action. 
Now, hiding Same in that point. is, yeah, you right. have to face it so that you can take action. But the idea is to get busy solving the problem. And I don't know how much you know about Andrew Huberman and the, mm. you can reprogram somebody's thinking by getting them to move their eyes laterally. Hmm. And the reason he hypothesizes, and this makes a ton of sense to Doing me, it now. is that, yeah, feel better. Is, is that when you move forward, your eyes are constantly scanning to the sides to keep you moving on your path. So it is the thing that we do when we are moving forward. And so you're giving the brain the subtle signal that I'm moving towards this, I'm dealing with this. Hmm. And so there's a sense of like lowering of the anxiety, which 100% I experience every time I'm like really concerned about something. I'm like, if I just start building out a plan and going and attacking this, I'm going to change my neurochemistry guaranteed 100%. And it's the one thing, to your point, that people don't end up doing. Like they never turn and face it because it there is there is the most friction right before you break through and are like, oh, now I'm dealing with it and everything's going down. Because you don't want to look at it, you don't want to deal with it. Ah. But right, we're also not taught that principle, right? Mm. Like I love the way you just framed it. It is right on the precipice is when it's most painful, and then you cross the threshold, and then you feel the relief. And I think there's a sub point why it brings such peace is because anything that you could do that could zoom you into the present is going to make you happier, full stop, right? So for some people that could be meditating, it might be a walk in a park, nature, play with my kids. And then anticipation of, of the thing that which we haven't faced takes you out of the present, brings you into the future where it's not a happy place to be. So I think it's both the piece of just relieving of the anxiety, but it's also uh, one less thing that's taking you out of the present. Mm, that's interesting. I don't think about it as being... About the present, though, meditation for me is really profound. Why do you think, so here's, when people talk about being in the present when you're meditating, here is how I've used that to work for me, and is this what you mean? The truth is hitting your career goals is not easy. You have to be willing to go the extra mile to stand out and do hard things better than anybody else. But there are 10 steps I want to take you through that will 100x your efficiency so you can crush your goals and get back more time into your day. You'll not only get control of your time, you'll learn how to use that momentum to take on your next big goal. To help you do this, I've created a list of the 10 most impactful things that any high achiever needs to dominate. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. All right, my friend, back to today's episode. So when I focus on my breathing, it, it just occupies my mind. And so it doesn't let my mind drift. Like for me, even listening to the sound of rain will help, which I do a lot, uh, will help ground me to just, there's a thing happening in my brain. So my brain isn't wandering as much. It's very interesting. Yeah, same point. The only the only difference here is that there's a negative, which is preventing the ability to hear the rain or listen to the breath, which is the preoccupation with that, which we haven't faced. Mm. So it's just, to me, it becomes an impediment to zooming you into the moment. But same exact point, you know, it, it, uh, it's, 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 I just think it's not just about facing the thing that you haven't faced. It's about the obstacle to bring you back to the moment. So what is the value in being present? Is it so that you can deal with it or is it a neurochemical shift that just stops your mind from spiraling out of control? I just think present is the only truth. And so when you reconnect intellectually, neurochemically with the only truth, the only thing we're given and granted, there's a lot of peace. I mean, I, I, I have an app on my phone since my th kids think I'm crazy. But after I had cancer, actually, mm -hmm. let me tell you a little bit of backstory. I had testicular cancer when I was 32 years old. And what I found after going through the fear that I might die, I, I, I connected with this idea of, of zero time that all I would sit in my car because I didn't know where to go. And I hadn't gotten the diag a full diagnosis. They thought I was a later stage cancer. And I was like, Oof. okay, I don't, the New York Times real estate section doesn't resonate anymore because I'll be dead before I can buy the brownstone. Like all my thoughts don't hold up to the prospect of imminent death. Mm. And yet we walk around all day with that prospect. And once I um, uh, knew that I wouldn't die, I had to go through you know surgery and lots of, and I still carry a lot of the consequences of, of being a survivor, but I wasn't going to die. I began to savor the experience, to be honest. I began to enjoy the fact that something brought me into this moment to such an extent. And I've tried to hold on to that my entire life. Okay, so I want to differentiate between okay. being in the moment during meditation, which is like literally I'm here with yep. my breath, right. and being in the moment that I don't have years, and so now I'm thinking very differently. These feel like two very different they ideas. They do, they do, but similar outcome, and they're sort of corollary, they're cousins maybe, that the um, 
the awareness, let's talk about face everything. We are afraid to face our own mortality. We don't know why we're here. We don't know where we're going. A lot of people are at least. And I think our relationship with it is inverted, which I didn't realize until I thought I might die, that actually contemplating our mortality a lot relieved me of caring about the future anticipation, the things that were taking me away from the moment, from the, from the, from the, from the present. And I started going deeper into like, why is that? And then you read the happiest people on earth are in Bhutan. They contemplate their mortality five times a day. And so I have an app on my phone called We Croak that in uh, throughout the course of the day is reminding me in very lyrical, beautiful ways, you know, Descartes, Socrates, that Matt, you are in fact going to die. Mm -hmm. And what it does, it zooms me back in to the moment. So slightly different, but similar that I think that the happiest place that you can spend your time is here now with you. It's really interesting. I'm going to make a hypothesis. Okay, you tell please. me if you think this is true. So I tried for a long time. The thing that was most beneficial to me was to think about living forever. And mm. that got me really motivated. There's a book called Einstein's Dreams. And every it's a bunch of short stories. And all the short stories are about time. And one of them is a world where you live forever. And in that story... Everybody bifurcates into one of two kinds of people. People that do nothing because there's always time to do it later and people that do everything because now the statement that haunts my dreams is no longer true, which is that you can be anything you want but not everything. And so I very much fall into that second camp of if I could live forever, I would do everything. I'm like, oh my God, these skills are gonna stack and stack and stack and stack and stack. It's living forever is as close as you could get to a superpower just because you could get good at so many things. And so... For a long time, that was my meditation. No, you might live forever. Go as fast as you can. Acquire as many skills as you can. You could do it all. And it was really motivating. And then somewhere in my mid-40s, that started to feel like it wasn't the right way to think about it. And so then I started to think about, okay, as of today, you're not going to live forever. But it, it's interesting. I get why you're calling it putting me in the moment. But here's what it did. This is my hypothesis. The reason that dying is so cathartic for so many people, the, the, especially if you come out the other side and you don't actually die, that thinking you're about to die is so cathartic. Jim Carrey has a whole story about being in Hawaii when the, the missiles are coming, a nuclear missile strike on its way. This is not a drill, that whole thing. And he was like, well, I guess this is it. And he said he's been able to carry that idea with him forward. The reason I think that that is so effective for people is you no longer have to give a shit about what other people think. Now, every um, theory is autobiographical, so that clearly is the thing for me. But the idea of like, because I think we're all the shout and the echo. I don't think there is a way, like the shout is the things you do and the echo is what people tell you about the thing that you did. I don't think there's a way to, ab to get away from that. I doubt even monks are completely abstracted from that. I'm sure they care about what other monks think, whether they want to say <laughs> they do or not. So. Um, it would be off brand though. Yeah, yeah, very true. But nonetheless, probably true. Uh, what do you think about that? Wow, it's a lot to unpack. I, I think for me, why it brings relief and peace is exactly what you said about you stop caring what other people think, which is similar to also stop worrying about outcomes and to the extent to which they judge. I wondered if that's what you meant about legacy. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think back to death for half a second. Like when you, when you, one number one, it's technically true. We're facing the prospect of imminent death, right? We don't know when. So mm. it's actually true. Right. No, no conjecture about that. Yeah. Uh, could be when I walk out this door. That's right. Crazy. And the second thing is I know that if I were to, to take, go back into that moment with a reasonable degree of certainty, I'll probably regret all the things I cared about that just did not matter. Mm. And so reminding myself tries to make me not, not tries to make me, um, ameliorate that future regret, right. Or to mitigate that future regret in the very, in the moment. So it's, you know, very convoluted, but that's why I think it brings me at least, uh, peace. Have you been able to hang on to that? Because that no. was, yeah. No, unfortunately, because here's why. When I went through cancer and I had these wonderful epiphanies, that's completely impractical to implement, but but theoretically true. I was like, wait a second, though. I, like you, I'm motivated by the pursuit of excellence. And if I eliminate, if I'm no longer vested in the system, because it turns out I may die in 15 minutes, mm. what's going to motivate me to do what you were? I'm going to accumulate skills. I'm going to learn everything. Like, if theoretically it could be over very soon, you know, it's a very nihilistic view, right? Like, how, how will I be great? And then, but then I did realize there is another motivational system, which is the attempt to figure out what is my, what is, not only is what is my purpose here on, on earth, but what is the total capacity I was granted? Let me touch the ceiling of my capacity of my potential. And that motivates me just as much 
as this vesting in the system, right? I got to get a better job, prestige, money. I can achieve the same degree of success by wanting to touch the ceiling of my potential or my capacity. At that moment? So I don't understand. So if time is now super finite, Yes, exactly. And let's say you're like, oh, oh no, well, then what do year. I care? What does it matter? It, yeah, it, it, well, like, it's my it's my answer to my mind saying, well, if mortality is is, is, uh, is uh, or death is imminent or could be, then what makes me vested in showing up today or caring or mm. giving a great presentation? But I think, for me at least, I'm just as motivated. you want to perform? Like an athlete on the field, I want to exactly. see how well I can perform exactly. right That's now it. today. That, that I think that got brings it, me close it, to it. God. Like, oh, well, I, I mean, if we're all made in his or her image, whatever that may be, and I'm not particularly mm. religious, but I'm spiritual, that knowing what, what I'm capable of feels like I'm, I, I'm closer to the origin or wherever, whoever put me on this earth, right? Mm. So it's, that to me is just as motivating. Let me see what I can, let me see if I can write this book. Let me see if I can touch people, if I can move people. Let me see what happens. And what do you think now that you have kids? Is it a different game for you? Yeah. Yeah. I assume you do not have kids at that point. I just had had a kid. It was, okay. he was, oh, Jesus. Three, yeah, he was three months old. Oh. Yeah, that is that did require that that that, that it made a quick reframing instantly. That's all I desperately wanted to do was be there for the handoff, whatever mm. the handoff is. Did and you like end up writing letters or anything to? I I, 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 I didn't because fortunately it was a relatively short period of time when I thought like I could die to like eh, statistically. I'm, I'm a big statistics person. I was like, ah, in this cohort. Probably a waste of ink. <laughs> and I also didn't want to put him in, me in the group that writes a letter to their kid because then yeah. I thought maybe then I'll be in that death it's court. Your plan B. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. my plan B. <laughs> but but uh, but when A live, plan B yeah. document. Yeah, yeah, it did do one thing, which I would encourage everyone to do. It did clarify me saying, "What do I want my epitaph to read?" and mm. work backwards. And now, what did you want it to read? Yeah, that was the that was no, the no, beginning. No, I want to know. Oh, herein lies a great dad who did the best he could. I really, and again, you don't get a lot of words on an epitaph, so it's kind of effective. I wish I could have sub subtitles. And he also changed the world. And, but like, it, it really, I think, and I think everyone feels that way. But for me, it was partly to break the pattern. Mm. I wanted to break the pattern. Like, like I felt like if I could just, it wasn't just a good me. It was, it was a pleading with the God or the universe. Like, let me get this right, please. Yeah. So that I don't, you know, carry on. Cause all the patterns that we're subjected to, we're either repeating them or we're, or we're doing the opposite of them, creating their own new bad patterns. So it was sort of a bargaining with the universe. Like, please, like, let me get this right. But when it's all said and done, mm -hmm. and that was only because I had, I obviously had kids. If you don't have kids, you're, you're not, you don't understand how powerful that is. Yeah. I can only imagine, but even, even though I don't have kids, I get, like that sense of what that would be like to want to leave something for them, to want to do well for somebody else. In fact, that is the thing I understand so well that I get how that would be dialed to well, a you have that with your wife, kids. right? Your amazing relationship with your wife. I love reading that about and, what you talk about with your relationship with your wife. And, you. and, the, and you're, not a lot of people talk about the importance of partnership and as a force multiplier. And this book doesn't exist without my wife. My show doesn't exist without my wife. Which you make very clear in the book, by the yeah. way, which is definitely one of the things that I want to talk to you okay. about. But the the idea of wanting to do well for somebody else, I'm wired for that. Whether I should be or not is a different story. But again, going back to the idea of every theory is autobiographical, I always tell people, you, whatever you're going to pursue, if you want to get through it, you're going to have to find a way to connect it to serving other people. Like if you don't, and I think it's as close to universal as you're going to get. But saying that I'm doing this thing for me can be very motivating. But saying that I'm doing this thing for somebody else, like is, for me anyway, is just unbelievably powerful. It's interesting, I'd never thought about, why do I feel so, like I get it so much when parents are like, yo, for my kid, I would do anything. That's why. Do you think, uh, were you always that way? Were you that way in your 20s? I, I've been that way since I was a little kid. One of my earliest memories is throwing a Easter egg hunt so my sister, who's four years older than me, could win. And I was five or six. And I was like, I know how much this will mean to her. And so I'm gonna not, I'm gonna pretend I don't see that egg and make sure that she finds it. So yeah, I have been, I'm wired for that. I think we're 50% hardwired and 50% malleable. I was gonna say, I actually don't think that everyone is wired that way. Definitely not. I think there's a certain percentage that are sociopaths. There's a, there's a cousin named narcissist, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and that's been a hard thing is to retain my empathy, uh, which I think is my gift. It's been hard to retain. No, not hard. Empathy. It's the wrong word. It's not hard. 
I'm defense, I'm protective of it. Mm. It's to, to operate in a world where you allow your empathy to, to flow freely, but also protect yourself and be committed to self-defense. But at the mm. same time, um, I like, I never hold grudges, for example, because I don't want to let somebody be able to take away my empathy, but I am capable of making sure I beat you to a draw. And then I'll let the empathy flow, flow That's again. really interesting. So we're going to have to give people a little bit more of your backstory. So you are an extraordinarily accomplished investor and entrepreneur, been on Shark Tank as a shark, mm. um, invested in a lot of amazing things, uh, including VaynerMedia for people that know Gary Vee. You were his first client, essentially yep. own a piece of the company. Um, so some really big wins. That is normally associated with somebody who's a little sinister. <laughs> They're not afraid to step on people. Um, how have you been able to be successful, be a shark? I mean, it's literally called shark, uh, to be a shark and maintain that sense of not only integrity, but empathy. Yeah. Great question. Uh, the answer is I'd probably be more successful if I had less of it. Maybe that's the honest mm. answer, right? Like I am uh, not a sociopath and I do care. Um, I, I think you, if you, if you marry empathy with the intellect and pattern recognition, I think you can go pretty damn far in life. And the, the, uh, empathy unlocks a ton of value. I always say, when I look back at this crazy story of me, uh, post cancer, I don't think I told you this story. When I had cancer, um, and I was 32 years old, my number one concern was not, not, not dying, not right away at least, um, was not having one testicle, it was not even whether I would be infertile. It was, it was whether I would be picked apart by the villains who were waiting for me to be finally show my weakness. I get it. I mean, I was nuts looking back, so nuts that after I was diagnosed, you, you go real fast. They want that tumor out of your body because mm. they think it spread to your, to your lymph nodes and whatnot. I had it within 24 hours of surgery. It's like, well, can I, can I say Whoa, goodbye? From to, diagnosis, from to, diagnosis to removing Jesus. my right testicle. That's not a long time to say goodbye to like a that pretty important, a <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's not a particularly attractive body part, but I was still like, can I sit with this decision mm. for half a minute? And then 48 hours later, or within 48 hours, I was like, how do I show everybody that I'm not defeated? And there was a uh, dinner for all the coaches at the Jazz. Eric Mangini was at the time. You and I have a very different reaction to this story. Yeah. Very eager for you to tell people. Okay. All right. So I'm curious to hear your reaction. So I, I, um, I, I, I show up at this dinner and everyone's having wine mm -hmm. and I sit at the table. I have an ice bag in between my groin, Fuck right? Yeah. Like clear that I have just been operating on. And I'm like showing them how tough I am. And I have a little toast to everybody. Let me tell you what my new motto is that I'm soon to put on dog tags. And it says half the balls, twice the man. The 32 year old version of me thinks that that's cool mm -hmm. and tough. But before I say my interpretation of that story, I want to hear your interpretation of my story. Well, so I know your punchline. Okay. Uh, but but I, act I'm, like you don't and feel free to judge. I don't mind. No, 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 the, no judgment. It's, uh, it may say something more about me than it says about you. Okay. So. Uh, I'll give people your idea because I think it's better that they hear that first. So you realize, hey, this is cringy. And when I show up moments after surgery, it sends a message to everybody else. I don't give a fuck what you're going through. You better show up and you better do your thing. And I get that. And I try to be very protective that my team feels like, hey, if you need time, take that time. We're here to protect you. We use that language here. It's sacred. You're, we just had somebody, their mom fell, broke their hip in the hospital. They had to fly back to their home country, deal with it. I was like, we got you. Like, do not worry about a thing. We are on it. We will take care of you. It could be any one of our moms the next time. And I want you to protect me. But I love that hardcore shit so much. Like, I love that you showed up. Now, if you expected other people to do that, I would be grossed out. But the fact that you want to do it for yourself, the fact that you were like, I'm not going to let this beat me, all of that resonates with me still. And I'm not, I can't, you know, claim youth and no, say. No, but I like, but I, 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 so I think let's meet in the middle because I don't disagree with you. Let's talk about behavior that's changed and behavior that's not mm. changed. So for those listening, my 30 year old version of me thought that that was like, you know, so tough, right? But the, uh, with a little bit more perspective, and this only occurred to me when I went to my own divorce, right? I realized not only was I uh, expecting me to show up with one mm. testicle and an ice pack the next day, I was not understanding why everyone wouldn't want to show up, right? Like surrender to the mission. The, the, um, when I went through my own trauma that was much more significant than, than cancer, um, I realized 
I have been ignoring or overlooking or, you know, basically deciding that it's not that big a deal, everyone's trauma mm -hmm. and expecting generally the same that I, that the behavior that I was modeling. And that's not reasonable. It's not fair. And it's not good leadership. However, what I haven't changed is I still put myself through tremendous duress to achieve great things. Mm. When I teach, uh, when I taught at Harvard uh, Business School, you know, three weeks ago, I was going through something really tough on the home front, right? And I had a choice to make. Do I su succumb to that? Do I not teach this class that I've worked on for almost a year? Oof. Do I, but I have to show up for the family situation? Do I not do that? And then I was like, oh, there's a third choice. I will stay up for four days straight. God. Like literally, I'm going to try to sit an hour here, an hour there. I will put myself to the brink and that's my choice. And I, so I don't deny myself the right to make that choice when I'm trying mm. to do really hard, extraordinary things, but I make sure that I, I, that I do the best I can not to model that behavior, not to. So the way you just said about one of your employees that was mm. going through a uh, loss of a family member, right? Like, and you, you went out of your way to say, it's okay. Like I try to do that to the best of my ability. And I wouldn't have done that at 32. That's the difference. It's very interesting. So the I, only difference I would say too is the last point. I think anybody objectively watching me go ahead and show up at that dinner two days later would understand that that behavior is born out of dysfunction. That has unregulated behavior. It's such an outlier. I don't think that there's anything proud about. You know, I don't know what to do with that. I'm so, sorry. I don't no, mean no, no. to challenge your whole identity. I love it because I'm. I, I, I work nonstop on this book. I, like it's not that I'm not crazy about my work effort. It's just some things just don't really make sense. No, I love it. And I, I love encountering people that don't think the way that I think. Yeah. So I will keep exploring the edges of this. So um, I think it's very important to make other people feel like the choice that they need to make is a hundred percent like make right. it. So my wife taught me this uh, in that she just, her body cannot handle the amount of stress that my body can. And so for her, she'll start getting sick. If she tried to match me hour for hour, she'd get sick. And <laughs> my wife said, so, one time she started crying. She's like, I can't get up at four. Yeah. I'd be like, come on, babe. Like, let's go. Let's do math. <laughs> She'd be like, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I can't do it. And so at that moment, you're a dick. If you're like, come on, like, come what on the already. Fuck? Everyone, yeah. you know, right. Not right. fun, not cool. No, no respect for no. that whatsoever. But at the same time, I want to see if he's here. He is here. So that guy right there. Uh, came to me one day and he said, I want to be the CEO of Impact Theory one day. And I was like, don't say that if you don't mean it. And he's like, no, for real. And I was like, okay. So uh, <laughs> let me tell you, uh, I'll treat you the way I treat myself. And I'm not going to hold anybody else to that standard because they did not come to me and say that they want to be the CEO amazing. one day. Uh, and I love it. I love talking to him more than anybody else because I can just be like, yo, motherfucker, what are you doing? Like, you need to get going. And he, he has a phrase that he took from Goggins, who we were talking about before this. And Goggins says, carry the boats, right? Now, I've said many times, I love Goggins. I'm inspired by Goggins. I don't want to be Goggins, but I want to have that gear. And so being able to talk to him and push him in that way and see him like, yeah, yeah, I do love it. But I am very aware that the, it was Alex Hermosi. I don't know where he got it, so I always credit him. Okay. But he said there are three qualities that make somebody successful. An undying belief that you can do something great. Agreed. A terrifying fear that you're not worthy. Agreed. And the ability to delay gratification. I totally agree. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, I was like, I said, like, 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 what do you say? Because I always say, like when I was going through something really bad on the personal front, and I was overweight, whatever. I trained for a marathon in my basement, and I would only train on a treadmill in the dark, and I would stare at a red light on the on the wall for months. That's how I trained. Because you didn't want people to see you. Running. No, because I was trying to, to to get a different muscle, which is the ability to persevere through Got something it. with repetitive motion. Got when it. I'm always manifesting through power through something, you can't power through a marathon; you'll burn out. So it was like practicing, mm. you know, that level of deferred gratification and and that, that 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 patience muscle that maybe doesn't come totally naturally. But I like all three of those. I agree. Yeah, I mean, I hate the second one, but when I think about <laughs> yeah. the reality... Is that still true for you, the second one? A hundred percent. Doesn't that annoy you? It does, and it. you're the first person I've heard talk about it in the book where you said, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I make progress and I regress. Yeah. And so I talk about this in ITU a lot, uh, which is, hey, everybody, I've never been able to get rid of the negative voice. So I've learned not to death loop on it, so I can't <laughs> stop the first thought. It's going to arise whether I want it to or not. But I can stop myself from indulging 
in that like you're never gonna do what you want and all that just i talk about that in the um in the book too and i i I bet you can relate to this i think a lot of the packaging on instagram this is first of all there's a there's a we're overweighting now anybody who's gone through like crisis Mm. and reemerge like a phoenix and but it actually reinforces a myth because if, if you are telegraphing to the world i have figured it out and I went through a bad thing like you did. Now I figured it out. But you don't share the regression. Mm. Most people can't relate to that. So they're appreciative of the answers to the test. Do you care about people being able to relate to it? I do. I really? 100%, I, I just care what's true. No, I, I, I care. I don't want to be robbed of my origin story. I don't want to manifest in the world as a guy on Shark but Tank. But what if it was all of that? Your whole origin story, all, but people can relate. And they can only relate to natural talent. And they're like, oh, I don't, I don't even understand this guy. Like, I would hate not that. being born with it. It was like, it's like a death sentence. It's like, it feels. You know why? It's useless. That would mean if that, they can't relate. Yes, that would mean my whole thing. I think is objectively useless if people can't find a point of intersection and join me. Okay, help now, me break through then. So okay. here, I, I, and I don't mean it's something. useful to me. It's just I just think it's useless in terms of a, a higher order to things, right? Mm. Like I can't do anything more with my story than other than self enrichment. It's interesting. So you have a base assumption that if people can't relate to you, they're never going to take your advice. Um, that's a great question. I do think authority matters. I think like with these nice brands that I've collected mm. <laughs> shark tank, right? I, I'm at HBS. Like they, they matter because they give me presumed authority. But to me, that's the usefulness of those things you know, writ large, right? But I I do think that people are looking for reasons to say, yeah, but yeah, I can't. Mm. And so I won't ever really break through, break through if they can't find a place to intersect. And they don't have, it doesn't have to be factual intersection. It has to be emotional and spiritual. Like you can, maybe you can't relate to the idea that a guy drops out of high school at 16, self-possessed enough to know to do that, ends up in these terrible situations. But you can re- relate to somebody who had to overcome imposter syndrome mm-hmm. or, you know what I mean? Or life brings them to those things anyone can relate to. And what I'm most proud with the book at the moment is the extent to which every socioeconomic dem- demographic has reached out to me. That's hard to do where you, when you're at where I'm at. So mm-hmm. I think I got that right. But yeah, I would, I would. I just keep thinking in terms of utility of my life beyond myself. And if, if, he, if people can't connect and intersect, then it just doesn't have as much utility. And I don't want to manufacture it, but the stuff I put in the book, as you could say, it's not manufactured. It's, it's painful. And, uh, and people are now joining me on the journey. It's interesting. I may just be blind to the fact that I respond more to being able to relate to people than I think. The reason I like your book isn't because I can relate to it, though I can. The reason that I respond to your book is my bullshit meter pegs so fast with people. The, the reason, so I used to only interview people like you, uh, which I'll call in the empowering camp. It's it tactics, principles to live by. It's going to make your life better, which I can vouch for 100%. Your book, you, everything, like it's all that and people should dive in if that's what they care about. But I stopped interviewing just that because so many people are full of shit. And so the reason that I like your book I think isn't because I found it relatable. It's because the advice is actually real. And if people take your advice, whether they can relate to you or not, it will make their life better. This is interesting. I'm discovering something about myself. I'm going to keep going for a second. So I have an allergic reaction to the moment that we're living in right now where people are like, yeah, like it's okay. Blame the world. Like this has happened to me. And I, that, that makes me so way. angry because it won't fucking help you. Then, well, that's not, that's it like a lie. Won't help, it's... even if it were true. So I was um, giving a talk at Google of all places, and an African American in the front row said, "Tom, do you think things are going to be harder for me because I'm black?" And I was like, "Yes, almost certainly." But now what? And so you can be angry, you can blame people, or and I think there's only two options: you can go try to change the system, Martin Luther King, or you can get so fucking good that no one can stop you, Kobe Bryant. And it's like, those are your choices. And I have an allergic reaction to people that aren't interested in doing one of those two things. Hmm. Totally agree. My reaction is both allergic and a little bit empathetic. And the reason why, having been in politics before, my early like Republicans and Democrats are like cousins, you know, like one, one genetic strand difference between the two. I think I have a cynical view of it all, but I think actually the, uh, those people who've chosen to adopt the victim narrative, um, through every spectrum of type of individual background, 
they're being um, sold something that won't help them. And I feel like you're actually being manipulated with that narrative. Well, I, I have it's, 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 an, it's an attempt to, to change the sub subject, to make you look away and to make you not try, to be honest with you, like generally. But at the same time, I do think I tried hard in my book it's back to connecting with different individuals on, on a first pass of somebody reading it, uh, a woman had read it and she's from an immigrant family. And she said, I love your book. And I, and I, and I, I love so much about it. The only thing I kept um, finding when I was reading, it, I was like, but I don't quite see me in it. And I was like, really, why? And then she's like, because at the end of the day, you were a white male in this society. And of course I first react like, but wait, I was dropped out of high school. I was poor. I went through all this mm -hmm. stuff. And then as I sat with it, I thought, you know what? If I was from a different demographic, a minority group, right? The act of, of, of dropping out and getting a GD might to a, to a racist seem confirmatory. And the act of me, you know, growing up with a degree of privilege is aberrational, mm -hmm. right? And that somebody would look harder at my story to find the mm -hmm. why. And then I became obsessed with, I need to, to, to show who's ever reading this book from whatever demographic that I see you and I acknowledge you. You know, without whether or not this victim doesn't come into it, right? It's just that I see you and I hear you. And I tell the story in the book, which I love. At the end of one of my classes at Harvard, I was talking to uh, to uh, um, two black women, and they were talking about one of the speakers I had who used a lot of profanity in the class. And they said, um, it was an amazing conversation. And she goes, her name was Tracy. She goes, you know, I could never say that in this class. And I was like, why? And she goes, because if I did everybody would instantly judge me and conclude that I'm I'm only here for whatever reason. But more importantly, I'm ruining it for everyone that comes comes after me, every black woman who walks into this classroom now, because I will be judged by my behavior. And I was like, that's unbelievable. And I chose to put that in the story because I thought that is undeniable proof that I had an advantage. Even eating government cheese, being a poor kid, I had an undeniable advantage because I don't represent anybody but Matt Higgins. And if you come from a minority group, you carry the weight and the burden of everybody who comes, you know, after you. So, but now what? Fair. I don't get into the now what because I think my book Your is whole book is no, now my, what? exactly. I, know, I love saying, talking like, to you, by I, the way. I, I, my book is no, seriously. You're so the reason why people take you is not because you sold a billion dollar company. It's not. That's not anything. It's because you drip empathy and humanity. Like it's like I don't know if it's a god complex or what. <laughs> But like, honestly, I, I, really I, hope I not. no, but it, it is not in a positive way. Cause I feel like somebody put you on this earth, but like it exudes you. It's why I got emotional talking about my mother. Like you create this safe space and you're only delivering the facts. The now what I think is the book is the burn the boats. But if people can't see themselves or can't join me, I'm, I'm saying this to you to say, everybody can join you because of your empathy that, that radiates through all your content. Like you really give a shit. That is very <laughs> true. The, so I react very strongly. There's two, my wife will, <laughs> she'll, she will vouch for this. There are two reactions when someone hurts themselves. Oh my God, are you okay? And hey, be careful. What the fuck are you doing? I am very much that. Hey, be careful. What the fuck are you doing? So when I see someone I love hurt themselves, I'm just like, Yo, there is a solution. Stop smashing yourself in the hand with a hammer. And I, 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 it upsets me so much to watch people struggle. Like, I hate that so much. I want to see everyone win. And I have wasted so much of my life trying to help people help you. And I say wasted because some people just aren't going to do it. But what I, what I really want people to hear. Uh, it doesn't, if, if you meet minimum requirements intellectually, which unfortunately exist, but if you're listening to this show and you've made it this far, I guarantee you meet minimum requirements intellectually. But once you meet that, the world is stacked against some people way more than others. Yep. A hundred percent. I'm just begging you. Take Kobe Bryant's advice. Booze don't block dunks. No matter how much people may have hated Kobe, no matter how, the best scouts in the world were paid millions of dollars to go around the world and find people that could stop him from scoring baskets. They trained athletes, five of them, to be on a court at a time with their sole mission of stopping him from scoring points and, and fans in the crowds booing like crazy, going nuts. Despite all of that, that man scored 81 points in a single game. There are games that only score 80 some points. <laughs> and so that, that is so inspiring to me that 
oh wait, there are a set of skills that I could acquire that would let me get so good at something, people can't stop me from winning. They, they can't stop me. No matter how much they want to, they actually can't. And that to me is so inspiring. Like that's all I want people to get. And dude, it's hard and it really sucks that it's gonna be harder for some people than others, 100%. And trust me, when I look at Elon Musk, I am angry that I'm not that smart. And so he's just always and forever, he, it feels like he's always going to be able to out-execute me just because he can process data faster than I can. It's really, un he's a superhero living among us. You you can hate him, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, no, I'm with you. But he, oh, it is. A, we're living with Thomas Edison. Uh, yeah, I hate the way he uses his platform. Fair, I, I, I get hate it. it. I, like every day I hate it more, but you know, I don't take it's away It's hard to deny what he's built though. No. Wait, it's back insane. to you for half a second. What you were saying a second ago when you respond to like uh, the you know put, putting your hand in fire or whatever, and you know what stop the, smashing yourself in the head yeah, with a yeah, hammer. That one, yeah, stop. What the fuck are you doing? Even as you said it though, it didn't seem judgmental. It still it seemed like an anxiety response. Yes. Uh, so I don't. I think still think it's coming from the same place. No, yeah. It's more just like ah, like yes. You know, like, oh, but, but but it manifests as I dude. Look, I'm just so desperate for people to win. I want people to win. This is the thing where I could spin myself off emotionally. You have no idea. So first of all, uh, in, in that way, I've earned my stripes. So at Quest, it was basically all minorities. And I don't give a shit. Like, I don't care. I didn't care that they had criminal records, that they were drug dealers, former or current. Uh, I just wanted people to understand there is a set of ideas you can totally change your life forever. <sighs> but you have to put it to use. What is up my friend, Tom Bilyeu here, and I have a big question to ask you. How would you rate your level of personal discipline on a scale of one to 10 if your answer is anything less than a 10? I've got something cool for you. And let me tell you right now, discipline by its very nature means compelling yourself to do difficult things that are stressful, boring, which is what kills most people, or possibly scary or even painful. Now, here is the thing. Achieving huge goals and stretching to reach your potential requires you to do those challenging, stressful things and to stick with them even when it gets boring and it will get boring. Building your levels of personal discipline is not easy, but let me tell you, it pays off. In fact, I will tell you, you're never going to achieve anything meaningful unless you develop discipline. All right, I've just released a class from Impact Theory University called how to build ironclad discipline that teaches you the process of building yourself up in this area so that you can push yourself to do the hard things that greatness is going to require of you. All right, click the link on the screen, register for this class right now, and let's get to work. I will see you inside this workshop from Impact Theory University. Until then, my friends, be legendary. Peace out. I think people don't fundamentally believe it's possible as the end of the I think they just I think they just don't believe it's possible. And I think it's not going to happen with a bunch of empty Instagram, you know, platitudes about like, just do it. Uh, I think it, it takes more nuance than that. And we're not a world built on nuance. They just don't believe it's possible. They think the deck is stacked. I think we're sold a lot a bill of goods to believe that, you know, it can't happen or conspiracy theories and whatnot. They, we've just, we've lost our way from the celebration of the individual. You know, you just gave me the chills. Right? Say that again. We've lost our way from the celebration of the individual. Like, yes. like we, we do, like we, it's like lost in society for some reason. And we experience the world first individually and we need to experience it together. But obviously the individual is at the center of the journey. And yet we want to, we want to dilute the individual experience and we want to remove the individual from causation. We want to like, it's like this vast conspiracy to take the individual out of the equation. And you look at somebody like Emerson's incredible writing, favorite piece of writing. Writing I ever, if I had one piece of writing on an island, it would be self-reliance. Hmm. That one essay I would read over and over and over I again. I don't know it. I've never yeah. heard oh, it. Oh, really? Oh, I'm mm. so excited to share this with you. Please. Oh, great. Yeah, self-reliance. It's just really all these incredible. One of the one of the most central um, premises of it is one, don't outsource your judgment. It starts with a phrase in Latin, which is this, do not seek outside thyself. And it talks about the indignity of having an incredible idea, like an epiphany, but you refused to accept it because it was your own. And then later on, you're forced to accept it Whoa. from another. And the Whoa. indignity of being force fed your own insights from others. Yeah, it's an incredible piece. Mm. But the individual has lost its place in society and it's almost become like a Republican thought or an Ayn Randian thought, whereas to me, it's just facts. Um, but when you say things in a bombastic, like just do it, it's very hard for people to implement. It's too simplistic. Mm. Yeah, I agree with the too simplistic thing. Yeah. Okay, so 
getting out of the simplicity and into the nuance, I wrote down a bunch of the things that I took away from your book. I'm emotionally drained now, though. I don't know if I can do it. I know. We've, we've got really, so much started. more to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're just warming up. Uh, one of the things that I like is, so you're telling people to burn the boats, don't have the plan B, because, I mean, there's just a psychological principle at play that if you have it, you're not going to fight as hard. But then on top of that, you tell people to aim high. So this is... One of the things that allowed me to be successful was I had the audacity, going back to those three things, I had the audacity to believe that I could, that there was nothing that I couldn't accomplish. Now, actually, as I get older, I think that there are. I, I have really tasted my limitations. Hmm. Now, ironically, even though I have, I've developed enough scar tissue that I'm like, ooh, there, there, are there is a ceiling to my abilities, but I don't know that I'll ever reach it. And so it's this fascinating, like, Oh, I can see now that there are limits. There are things I won't be able to accomplish. But since things like the aiming high for anybody, let's say, is a ratio distance from where you are now. So my aim high may not be Elon Musk's aim high. I mean, he's literally talking about terraforming a planet. I admittedly don't have that belief in myself. And so I'm not even pursuing that. But I am trying to build the next Disney, which for me is like, whoa, like this is dizzying. And the irony is when we started, I said to my wife and co-founder, I'm not good enough yet to build the next Disney. And so there's somewhat of a leap of faith in a shared belief that you and I have that you have to aim high. Like go for something crazy, go for something that actually exceeds your current grasp, burn the boats in your way, and now figure it out. There is this gravitational pull towards um, incrementalism right? That we believe that life and experience unfolds like sedimentary rock, but you only perceive sedimentary rock in retrospect when you look back millions of years and it looks nice and organized. Mm. So what I mean by that is like, you first need to have the lemonade stand and then you get to have a bigger lemonade stand, then you get to have a business. And I think people look at their progression of their experience and success completely the wrong way. That the first thing we always have to consider is a step change. A uh, step change, meaning something that's completely detached from the experience that came before it, by mm -hmm. and large. And you envision opening the $100 million lemonade stand before you open or lemonade business before you open a lemonade stand. And the reason why is once you, and you've experienced this, once you have a company when you have a thousand employees and you think back to when you had, you know, 20, this, this, the problems are generally the same because most problems are people problems. And once you begin managing people, you have people problems, right? And, and so I find that if you bypass the step of saying, well, what if I went for a step change? What if I went all at it, that reach goal? You'll never be able to ask that question again. You could only ask it at the beginning. And most people ex believe that they have to have this approach towards incrementalism and they deny themselves the benefit of reaching really far. So, I'm always trying to put myself in positions that are tremendous reach. I'm always questioning why not. I never taught anywhere before Harvard Business School. It would have been more logical to go to Queens College. I certainly could have, mm. maybe Fordham Law, right? But I was like, why can't I try to teach it the best? I think I have it in me. Now, back to my instincts, trusting your intuition, there was nobody who could have confirmed for Matt that he was capable of walking into that classroom, right? That to tell me there's no data. So, I feel really passionate that anybody out there is listening. If you have a dream, do not submit to incrementalism before you've tested the idea of, of, of a step change. But how do you pull that off? Like, so I know what it takes to run a business. There are times where I'm teaching people business and I'm like, Jesus, like to get across the complexity of these ideas, it is so hard. It's so complex. Like even the throwaway comment, I want to burst out laughing because I know what's hiding in, oh, you have people problems. It's like, Whoa! like right. that is, that that's tomes this deep right. of how right. to deal with said people problems and all yeah. the variations that they come in. So how the hell have you figured this kind of like going back to this idea of principles, yep. how do you start like, okay, I'm going to sort of bucket these, like, yep. is it vision first? Like you have to be able to see it before you can execute it? Is it convincing other people? Is it understanding, are you a visionary or an operator? Like, how do you begin yeah, to help I think people? I, I think the first thing is, um, one, just 
as a general principle, never let anybody put you in a box and make sure you're not putting in your own box. So you have to sort of, you know, unchain yourself from what conventional wisdom is that says, this is what I am. This is what Because Matt you'll is. end up limiting yourself? Yes, because like for me, I, I never taught before. So if I'm listening to the peanut gallery, they'd be like, well, where do you get off? You're not, you don't teach. And I always have to deal with that response to my audacity all the time. Like, what do you, now you got a book? What do you know? Are you some lifestyle guru? That's the question. I'm like, no, asshole. I have something to say. But whatever. You go write a book. It, it only takes three years. Live so, a life worth writing a book about. Yeah, That's right, the real right, challenge. Right. So, so uh, this isn't a, a screed against um, expertise. Expertise does matter. It's a warning that you should be your own litmus test, at least start there, of whether you have what it takes. So my process is whatever audacious thing I'm looking to do, including like Shark Tank, right? Start there. How do you get on Shark Tank? Everyone asked me. I was like, there is no, you know, go on the internet and put your name in. Like it was a year's worth of meetings, but I had to start like, because there is no litmus test by saying, what does it fundamentally to be mean to be on Shark Tank? Well, one, you have to have a history of being an investor. All right. Well, I did that. Two, you have to be presumed to have some platform, some reach, have that. And perform well under a camera so that they want to put you in front of one. Think I have that. Four, have a good, compelling origin story, right? Well, I think I have that, right? So now it's the how. The how is a lot easier, actually. Everything has a how. I just have to look for the how. When it came to Shark Tank, is a guy named Reed Bergman. He had helped uh, A-Rod get on the show. Like, he's my agent. You know, there was a how. It was the first part of, def- of deciding what's the litmus test and relying on my own judgment to say that I belong on that show. Because mm-hmm. if, if, if you don't do that, then you're just delusional. I'm not one of these people that's like, plan A or all in. Like, I go through a process to determine whether the goal is delusional. I just don't rely on, on external validation because external validation will always tell you it's not your time. That's or you're so not important. good, right? You're not good enough. I really hope people heard what you just said. Yeah. That you don't have a delusional plan A and burn the boats. And then you're like, well, I'm now fucked. No, not you. at all. I'm very risk adverse. So my plan A allows pivoting and iteration, but like every audacious goal, you know, like I have a hierarchy of goals with the book, right? My number one goal, which was the hardest one is like, let me connect with people in a way that's unusual. Let me not write a boring business book that's redundant after the third chapter. Let me write a story. Mm. Well, story takes a fuckload of work. I was like, well, I was a journalist when I was a kid. I was a little reporter. I was nominated for a Pulitzer when I was 19. You know, the hell? Yeah, anybody could be. You and I can nominate each other. Uh-huh. But Carl Bernstein nominated me. Jesus. He's on the board of directors of my company. So I always have to caveat that very clearly. Anybody can be nominated. But I won a lot of awards for investigative journalism. Oh, I, I have the skills to tell a story. And I have a vision. Mm. I'm going to do it different. Then I have something to say. Point is, there's nobody for me to go on the internet. Does Matt Higgins deserve to write a book? And could it be a book that gains traction? And I think that's where people go wrong. They, they, there's a gravitational pull of incrementalism because incrementalism is the only thing for which we have data to validate our choices. Oof. Incrementalism, like, oh, I know that the person who opened a lemonade business would probably have evidence of having a lemonade stand, you know. So there's a conversation in my book about Jesse Darris. And, um, we ultimately kind of created a communications firm together and we went for this epic walk. And he's a risk adverse human. And, and his mind kept telling him, let me be the partner at this firm first before I'm capable of running my own business. And I was like, why? What is it about getting the uh, imprimatur of being a partner, you know, on a door that actually makes you more qualified to run your own firm? Because society told you that that was the, the logical sequence of events. Mm. And then in the end, we created the firm, obviously, or else it wouldn't be in the book. And he sold it for tens of millions of dollars. But I, those are the most transformed uh, trajectory changing conversations I have with people when I challenge their bias towards incrementalism. And we break down and people always know when, they, when it's right, they, they always know, oh, for me to run my own private equity firm, all I have to have is access to deal flow, a great network to raise money, the tenacity to keep going. And like, and off we go. There's a student in my book, Harvard student, was about to take a job with a soul crushing private equity firm. And he was in my office trying to help make, decide which crappy firm to take. And as he was talking, I was like, can I ask you a question? I was like, why aren't you just creating your own firm? And he goes, well, who's going to give me money? I was like, nobody until the one person who gives you the money. And when they fucking do, you're going to have your own firm. He, true story. Leaves my office after giving that speech. I'm like, I don't know. He's He, he came from the military. So he's used to corporate, hi- you know, military hierarchies. I'm like, I don't know if he has the w- willingness to break out of that gravitational pull. Three months later, whatever, he calls me. I'm like, let me, let me get your address. And I'm like, why? Well, I want to send you the swag from the firm I created when I walked out your office. I raised $10 million. And now, wow. I'm, ra- and now I'm raising $50 million. That was a long way of answering your question. I guess the, the question is not, it's, it's really about 
containing within yourself the ability to decide whether you have the expertise necessary, not whether somebody else grants you the expertise necessary or validates. So you've done a lot of crazy things. I think I'd heard you throw away that you were a journalist, but that one didn't sink in. Yeah. So the fact that you've done that, people don't even know about your time in the government, what you did with yeah. 9-11, the memorial, what you've done in the NFL. I mean, ah, right. it's like... Your story's crazy. You should be 75 <laughs> right, to have right. the so biography that you have. 75. It's pretty, pretty nuts. Um, how do you learn? Like, how do you go and, okay, I'm going to do this crazy thing that is new. It's a step function ahead. But at some point, you actually have to get good at that thing. How have you gotten good at that? Oh, that's such a great things. point. I, 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 I'm sure like you do, I have that voice in my head that, that does say, like, where do you get off, you know, a bit, Right. And then I have this tremendous desire to do well and to do right, to honor the whoever granted me entrance to the to the setting, you know, or a seat at the table. Mm. There's always somebody who decided, yeah, I agree. I agree with your litmus test. You do have what it takes. I'm going to open the door to you. Now I'm going to vouch for you. I might even put myself in harm's way by letting you in this room. I feel such tremendous obligation to confirm, even How at my do you age. Convince people to do that. Are you really good at that? Because like you're firm. RSE, uh, you guys say we're about connecting the dots. Yeah. And the testimonials, I don't know if you prompted people, but they were all like, oh, they know how to connect dots. Uh, that, that is my kryptonite. How, how do you find- Wait, what do you mean? In a good I, way or a bad way? No, no, I'm terrible. I don't, networking is my kryptonite. Oh, I hate connecting I'm terrible dots. at networking. I hate networking. I'm the most introverted human. This is the first meeting I've had in a year. I don't even leave the house. I just hang out with my wife. You and I are. No, I'm really same. so introverted. Yep. People, people both. don't believe it because I have oh, charisma. I you have charisma, right? Charisma is just an accident. <laughs> like I so introverted. I'm lost in my mm. head. Um, same. so when I say connect the dots, it's more people. You know how these investment firms put such a bullshit narrative to make things tidy? Like, we are only doing mm. in this, you know, Series B, whatever. Like, I don't have the need to do that because it's myself and Steve Ross. We're partners, right? But he connects. For those that don't know, it's Steve Ross, Steve Ross. Yeah, Steve, Steve Ross. Ross, right. So, he, yeah. you know, largest developer in the United States, tremendous entrepreneur. But he gives himself permission to play in such attenuated places and spaces and doesn't care what anybody thinks. Mm. But when you look back, how did he get here? And I'll give you an example. Uh, for those who don't know, my firm does, you know, consumer broadly. We're in food. I'm partners with Dave Chang and Momofuku. I've done a lot in sports, huge international soccer business. But there was a time when Steve and I decided we would buy Formula One. And I had, based upon my experience in sports, know that the asset was completely un under optimized. Spent two years attempting to buy the entire sport. It does not work out, right? <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, uh, but the consolation prize, but we understood enough about the sport and what was wrong with deal structures on these races that we ended up incubating a race in Miami. So now we have what I believe is one of the coolest races in the world that takes place every May in Miami. So is it a Formula One Formula race? One race. Yeah. We brought a wow. Formula One race to the United States. Hmm. And I never would have done that. So if you are looking for a tidy narrative, an F1 race and a sea of other things next to Momofuku might not make sense, but there's a reason. So when I use connected dots, it's actually leveraging that which came before to put the pieces together. It's mm -hmm. not so much networking. That's really interesting. So, but, vision... my, but, my, but my body, I'm not my body, me as an individual, as the self is operating mm -hmm. under the same general principle. And that I, I don't know how much uh, you're into real estate, but there's a phrase in real estate zoning or philosophy called highest and best use. It's a way to ensure that you don't have a piece of property sitting in the middle mm -hmm. of a, a metropolitan area that's zoned to only be a two story church, you know, in the year 2023, right? So you want to make sure a property is always put to its highest and best use. I treat myself like a piece of property that's constantly being rezoned every week. Wow. Sounds a bit crazy, but I ask myself every week, sometimes every day, what is the highest and best use of Matt Higgins today? And the reason why that question is so important, I'm an amalgam of all these accumulated experiences that now give me permission for a step change into a new environment. And so- Dude, I like that so much. Oh, thank you. It's That's like, really powerful. Yeah, I'm obsessed with that thought. And that is really the formula that I'm operating upon. So when I finished Shark Tank, which was a great experience, mm. I remember sitting with my wife on the second time on the set, and, and I kind of went all in and I was like, babe, let's just sit here for a minute. Cause I don't think I'm ever going to be back on the set. She's like, no, you're a recurring shark. They named you. I was like, don't think I'm coming back. I don't know why, but, but it's just okay. was no longer the highest and best use. Or? It would no, no. Well, be just because I feel like they'd move on and they were more mm. charismatic, you know, whatever. I just thought that the journey would end here. Right. And, and my point is once I did that though, I said, 
what would actually be better than now that I've done Shark Tank? What's the highest and best use of Matt Higgins now that I've done it? Oh, creating your own Shark Tank. And fast forward, I partnered with Mark Burnett to create our own show yeah. called Business Hunters, right? And then after I did that show, I was like, huh, well, now that I know how to do a show, wouldn't it be better to like own the show outright? And so I created a production studio with Gary Vaynerchuk and Eric Wattenberg. So I'm just showing you how that mentality. Now, people listening are going to say this is exhausting. So I don't, you know, like, I'm sorry. I apologize. It doesn't have to be like that. I'm just trying to show how you can make big hopscotches if you want in your life. It's interesting. I really, maybe they will, but I would be... If people are exhausted by it, I'm learning. So let me start with that. And so because this is the thing that um, this really changed my life. So I met entrepreneurs that they were just farther ahead than me. And while they didn't have the words that you're talking about, about aim high and all that stuff, it was like I watched them do it. And I was like, oh, I'm playing way too small. Interesting. Oh, I can be way more aggressive than I'm being. Interesting. Like even now to your point about people problems, the when when I have people problems in the company, it's almost always because people underestimate what they can pull off. And so they're not moving with urgency, they're not being aggressive enough, they're not like reaching far enough, making demands of people, et cetera, et cetera. So hearing how you move, hearing your story, hearing what you've done in soccer, hearing how you spent your time in the NFL, what you liked, what you didn't like, it's really interesting because I'll add something. I think you're going to agree with this. Okay. So you're, you're looking for what's the opportunity? What's underserved? Like you said, F1 is an underutilized asset. That also ties into what you were talking about with Emerson, where it's like you have to have a, 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 an epiphany and then trust it. And look, you're going to get slapped in the face sometimes because you're going to be wrong or mistimed or whatever. Right. But if you're learning from that every time and you act with a boldness and you look for how do I connect the dots? I mean, this really is like, so the, the step function change, God, the step function change, I'll, I'll explain, I'm nesting ideas, but the, the step function change of really reaching beyond what you're currently capable of is the path from getting out of your sort of rut nine to five, yeah. like I'm only ever going to achieve this much and doing something really extraordinary. Okay. Now that that idea is finished, just yesterday, one of my students from Impact Theory University applied for one of our jobs, got on the call, and he's not the right fit, and I told him so because he doesn't have enough experience in that thing for me to feel like, okay, like you need to go get knowledge that would be useful in this job. But as he was telling me his story about what he had applied that willingness to step function, he'd got into surgery. And so he's on the, uh, there's a name for it, I'm forgetting now, but basically they sterilize everything and they're the ones when you say scalpel, they had to do the scalpel, that whole thing. Okay. This kid took himself from Watts, which if anybody is familiar with South Central LA, Watts is rough, rough. And so we used to hire a lot of people out of Watts. So I, I know what I've seen Watts up close. That's one of the few places I've been scared in broad daylight. <laughs> it is, it, it's, it's a whole thing. Yeah. And so he took himself from that to getting all the way there by saying, okay, I'm going to believe that I can learn. I'm going to push myself. He was taking a bus four hours a day to go to school. Just really incredible when people get out of that rut, start looking at, okay, what is uh, the highest and best use of my current skill set? How do I get out of my, um, God, what'd you call it? You're challenging the conventional wisdom. Mm-hmm. So something, something along those gravitational lines. Pull maybe? Yeah, no, no, no. The, okay. One of the very first things you okay. said, like you really have to break outside of that. Like, mm-hmm. oh, this is the standard path and most people just do that and that's it. Yeah. So you end up like for him, the standard path would have been basically day labor and you know, that's that. And so for him to push outside of that, get on a surgical team, it was really amazing to hear him talk about hey, I'm deploying these ideas and I'm using it to like make these leaps. So anyway, this is all a reaction to you saying that people are getting exhausted. But that to me, there, there's a nugget there that's hard to encapsulate, which is you need to be getting yourself in new rooms with new people that force you to learn new things. You need to be freakishly looking for what's the opportunity here? How do I connect dots that other people aren't connecting? And then just keep leapfrogging. 
for me, um, giving people practical advice. Well, how do I identify that breach? Mm-hmm. Right? What is the thing? You know, the 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 opportunity or the arbitrage? Like, where is it? I feel convinced that everybody has um, within their life a proprietary insight that could be the seed of, if not a new business, not everybody has to be an entrepreneur, but at least um, a promotion or or a step change of their mm-hmm. life and sort of to unpack that. And we think about the best businesses of the last you know 20 years that stick with us, the brands like Airbnb, for example, they're not they're not inventions like Shark Tank leads you to believe. They they Shark Tank leads you to believe that you have to have an invention to you know to have your own autonomy and run your business. Nothing could be further for the truth. Usually it's a refinement or an improvement of a process, right? And so um, when you look at Brian Chesky and his co-founders of Airbnb, you know he slipped on a futon mm-hmm. at one point. And was like maybe other people would want to rent futons, which is a preposterous idea in '09. Like everybody's going to steal shit. <laughs> you know they're not going to pay. Like this, I don't know how, how he had that insight, but for some reason. Him and his three friends recognized that the sharing economy was going to explode and extend to houses. Mm-hmm. And now he has a $100 billion business because of a proprietary insight. Everybody listening to this right now um, sees something that is a proprietary insight that in order to bring it to fruition now, you have to eschew incrementalism mm-hmm. and have the courage to make a step change. So when I was on my show um uh, business hunters, and the whole purpose was to take somebody who wanted to start their own business and give them, um, and and help them determine which business to buy, like house hunters. Right? This is a show that did not air. Uh, we're still trying to find a home. But I was sitting there talking to these two sisters from the Bronx, and I was asking, well, "What do you do now?" He's like, "Well, wh- I have five Airbnbs." I'm like, "Where are they?" I think they were in you know Georgia. I'm like, "Oh, well, why there?" He's like, "Well, we have a lot of visiting nurses there." And I, and I know the visiting nurses can stay for extended stays 30 days and they pay better because they're subsidized. I'm like, huh, well, how'd you figure that out? Well, I used to work in a hotel. What'd you do at the hotel? I was just at the, at the, at the front desk, but I would always hear visiting nurses come in and wonder why they were staying so long and we, and they, and we charge them more because, you know, that's, that was the setup with the visiting mm-hmm. nurses. And I thought if I could create an Airbnb as a network of them for visiting nurses, mm-hmm. I could have an annuity business. I'm like, that was my, I was like mind blowing. That's a proprietary insight. Mm. So for anybody listening, we're like, wait, I've had one of those. You know, that's what gets me excited about the book. Can I, can I deconstruct what it looks like to have both a proprietary insight and what a step change would look like? Mm. She could easily have said, well, before I can run my own Airbnb, I need to be the manager of a hotel first. Right. So I'm going to wait three or four years. This is what most people do. So and I just, for whatever reason, I don't know if it was my mom or God, but I was like, I was not wired to accept those boundaries. Mm. I, I challenged them until one of them beats me into submission, which happens regularly. Oh, for sure. For sure, right? Dude, this is so interesting. So you're... Here's a trick that I do. So I want to help people um, cross a bridge. So people are going to hear this and they're going to get in the room now and they're going to be looking for that proprietary insight and they're not going to know how to manufacture it. I think there's a way. So here's what I do. This is how I interview. This is how I read books. This is how I um, come up with vision for where to take the company. I'll look at something. And so I did this with your book. So I read your book and I start myself with the question, what's interesting here? And then what I try to do is break down what I think your thesis is without going back to reread, just without looking at my own notes. What, what's interesting? What is this thesis? What's the, the narrative thread that you've woven? And what it forces you to do is understand it. And so if somebody finds themselves in the room in F1, soccer, you're in over your head. You have no idea what's happening. The, the thing that changed my life is when I get in that room, I'm not afraid to look stupid. Because if I ask until I understand, I can have a proprietary insight because now I actually understand it. But if, I, if I'm if i just like, oh yeah, and I wanna look cool and I'm, yeah, 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 no, I get that for sure, yep, yep, yep. And then you don't understand it, you can't synthesize it at the end. And so you you have to push yourself and you're it's gonna make you feel like an idiot, at least it does me. So I always end up feeling really stupid for a second. So I'm like, wow, I don't actually understand this. What is this? How do I connect that? And I have to ask, oh, what about this? Yeah. And But once I get it, and I think of myself like AI, and I'm like, I need to feed the Tombot. I need to (laughs) to force the data into my brain and go, okay, once I understand it, then my subconscious will start working on like how it's usable, what it can be deployed against. It will interact like almost like, you know, chemicals interacting with each other in ways that I couldn't have predicted. So again, a nested idea in... The Nobel Prize, typically, they're one at the intersection of two things, biology and chemistry, whatever. And so it's like, 
when you have two worlds colliding, you'll get far more unique insights. So I had this happen very profoundly for me in comic books. So uh, this was six years ago. We're launching Impact Theory. I know that comic books are a traditional feeder into film and TV. So I'm like, all right, let's do comics. Low dollar amount, potentially big win. So we create a comic. We get it printed. We get it distributed. And I'm, I've had 40,000 plus points of distribution in, at Quest. So I know what real distribution looks like, real volume, like 2.5 million bars a day or whatever. I mean, it's just insane. All over how many, 100 countries, whatever it was. Amazing. Just, yeah, nuts, right? And so I'm used to knowing what shelf I'm on, who's category captain, like all of like, ah, like what, how am I selling in Poughkeepsie with this skew, right? And you're getting it in almost real time. And I go into comics, there's one distributor and they give you no information. And so I was like, time out. This is so crazy. I'm like, either we buy the distributor or we get out of this completely. And so we ended up getting out of it because it was self-evident to me because I understood distribution, I could have a new chemical reaction of what I knew from, even though it was from nutrition manufacturing, it was helping me in comics because I understood it. And it's like, if you force yourself to understand and synthesize, now as you go into a new space, you can make unique connections, get these proprietary insights. Anyway, I wanted to give people a way no, to connect I love it. that. And if anybody's listening to what you just said, because this is where the mind goes, they'll be like, yeah, but when I when I ask questions, I feel stupid because I, it exposes where I came from, my background, my deficiencies. The way I immunize myself is what, because I do exactly what you did. I don't, I don't give a shit. I'm, I'll ask questions. I'm not afraid. Um, I, I, I'm, I transport my this whole room that I'm in to a different, to my playing field, where I know they'd be out of their depth. Mm -hmm. And I imagine, well, and this could be as simple as, you know, you play Twitch all day and you're a great gamer, whatever it is that you're a little patch of dirt that you own, transport that room to your territory and imagine them out of their depth because everyone's out of their depth and you are always in your element somewhere mm -hmm. to immunize yourself from the insecurity. But love the way you put the pieces together for those listening who want to say, okay, but make it even more actionable. I tell the story in the book. I love this story because this is irrefutable evidence of what a proprietary insight, what somebody could do with a step change. Michelle Cordero Grant was a uh, maybe like a director at Victoria's Secret in the marketing department. And she kept being alienated by her own marketing, thinking, it feels like we're talking to women only as you know objects to please men. Mm -hmm. And all the branding around our branding, uh, maybe, and maybe I'm being too harsh, maybe it wasn't as harsh. Sorry, Michelle, if that's not exactly what you said, but whatever. And so, but I believe there's another um demo and cohort that would like to wear this clothes for their own edification to feel good, body positive, sexy, whatever it is. But I'm just an executive at Victoria's Seeker, right? So what does she do? She's like, I think this is a proprietary insight. Didn't use those words. Creates a, you know, a, a community to crowdsource it, creates a waiting list. It like blows up, right? So now she knows there's a market for this. But the problem is she's an executive, mm -hmm. right? She has to make this. She can either now go work for someone else's company or she could lobby Victoria's Secret to create a new line. Or she could cross the threshold and say, I think I have what it takes to be a founder and a CEO, and I'm going to do it. She quits based on the strength of the community. So my point is to everybody out there, don't be afraid to share your idea with others. Mm. I, you know, people always worry about oh, somebody's going to steal it. When somebody says they're worried about somebody's going to steal it, uh, it's the end of the meeting for me. It's like, you're, you're, there's a great line in the social network movie. If you had invented Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. Yep. Like, don't be afraid. She shares her idea. She quits. She creates a company called Lively which is all premised on this idea. And she sells it for a hundred million dollars within five years. Whoa. So n now she's a woman of color. She was never a founder before. She had no money there. You cannot remove yourself from the, from the truth of that story. So anyone out there listening mm -hmm. that wants a case study, reach out to Michelle and say, how'd you do it? But I believe everybody, that insight was so simple, right? Like, what, why, why aren't we talking to this other group? Everybody has an insight like that within their grasp. Not that everybody needs to be a founder. Michelle could have leveraged that for a promotion too. So I don't want to just talk about like fetishizing the entrepreneur. I hate that crap. Right. But you know, anyway, I just love that story. The elegance of it. It is a great story. Yeah. Having the gumption to act on that and to start your own company. It's very impressive. Right. Very and impressive. she didn't take on a co-founder. So I use it for two reasons. Whoa. Cause, cause, and you talk about partnership all the time with your wife. Like, uh, the one of the top questions that people have at Harvard 
at the uh, at the end of these 17 classes. They always want to know how the founder chose their co-founder mm. and how to decide whether you need a co-founder. She actually didn't have a co-founder. And uh, in the book, I go through her process for deciding she didn't need one and how she thought she could pull That's in. Right, I remember that. Yeah. Walk people through that. It's actually, so I have always had a co-founder and probably always will. Going back to, I love winning as a team. The idea, I like to see other people succeed which makes me like being on a team, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But she had a really logical way of thinking about how she could get around it. Because it wasn't yeah. like, oh, I can do everything myself. No, it was, it was basically she, she honestly asked herself, what are the deficiencies uh, in my skill sets or my expertise or desire? And can I backfill those or augment those by hiring people versus equitizing a co-founder? Mm. And as she went through each one of them, supply chain, all the other issues, she felt like I could hire that person. Now, Oftentimes people get that equation wrong and they think, I find this a lot with like robots, people who are kind of like robotic and they want the world to be driven by Excel or AI, mm. that they, they they have a disdain for marketing and EQ and they're like, I'll just hire some TikToker, you know, with almost like disdain that never works out. So, but the conclusion in my Harvard class, whenever we ask successful co-founders, how'd you choose? They always uh, contradict what the students believe. They said, um, complementary skill sets is way subordinate to value overlap. I chose my partner, Bob or Sally, whatever, because we looked at the world the same way. And why that mattered is companies fail when things go wrong and we can't survive. Mm -hmm. And when you have value overlap, we're able to survive. So I, I thought that because conventional wisdom is augmenting where you're weak. Mm -hmm. And they said, actually, overlap where you're strong, which is your value system. And then subordinate is maybe. But if not, you know, winners will winners will figure it out. Yeah, I'm a big believer that choosing a business partner is like choosing a spouse. I think you want somebody who overlaps on your values, like 80%, 85% of your values better be the same. Otherwise, you're going to have collision. There are two collisions that can really cause uh, a breakup, and that is a values collision or a collision of base assumptions that you never recognize. And I see that one a lot. Like if you're having a problem in your marriage, I guarantee it's either a values collision or a base assumption collision. Basis, I think people will get values, but base assumption is that I invisibly think the world works in X, Y, Z way. And the other person invisibly thinks the world works in a different way. Values is ought. The world ought to be this way. Base assumption is it is this way. And so often people don't realize you have codified the world in that way. It's not necessarily objectively true, or at yeah. least not in some binary way. And so I found this was from working with my former business partners. I would sit there and be thinking, they're a fucking idiot. And they're talking to me like they think I'm an idiot. And so I'm like, I know they're not, and I'm not. So what is happening when two smart people think that the other person is a moron? And I was like, oh, wow. For Because I... I'm a writer by trade. And so I always go back to, if I were writing this person as a character, what would they need to believe for them to be acting this way? <laughs> and so I was like, he would have to believe that this is true. And I remember one day I stopped him and I was like, do you think this is true? He's like, yeah, obviously. And I was like, oh my God. And so then I was like, okay, this we're going to call this base assumption from now on. So your base assumption is this. My base assumption is this. Now we can actually talk about it. One of us is probably right and one of us is wrong. But at least now we're talking about the real thing. And yeah, I think that's really important. So anyway, you have to have overlapping values with your founder, or spouse, whatever. But I do think that you want to have, that you will be best suited if you guys don't think the same way. So you value the same things, but you don't think the same way. There's a great quote, I don't know if you've heard this before, mm. but that if in business you and your partner think the same way, one of you is irrelevant. And I've that really resonates with me. I, 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 so I would agree with your caveat to value overlap. I think at the end of the day, when when there's not a clear reason for why both of you exist, that is a recipe, can be a recipe for a disaster. Mm. So whether it's saying, you know, think exactly the same way or it's, you know, a, a, um, a bias towards one particular area of the business is actually helpful. I find where people, where partnerships go wrong, cause I'm often stepping into like a failed partnership or trying to work it out. Mm. I mean, that, that fact pattern recurs over and over again, because that's where opportunities happen, right? There's a yeah. lot of value destruction when partnerships go mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. And I found when I look at the, the genesis, like how did this partnership form? And oftentimes 
it's because there was a uh, there was an interloper into an industry that had a vision for doing things differently, mm. but they either believed that they were deficient in some area or they needed subject expert subject matter expertise. Wow! They go ahead and they choose a partner. The problem is because they had the courage to to invade the industry that only lasts like four months before they're like, "This is all stupid. You guys are all stupid." And then now they're stuck with the co-founder who is born of that industry yep. and not born of disruption. And then eventually they're just stain or you know wow. conflict sets in that makes a lot of sense yeah. and there really is a temptation to do that to there get is. somebody that really knows well, the space it's logical that's why i thought michelle cordero created yeah. the book i'm like well she didn't have that because she was from the industry she knew what she wanted to disrupt but mm. i see that fact pattern over and over again i don't think it applies to personal personal uh, life i think the augmenting you know or, or fill uh, completing applies mm. more to personal but i see that in business all the time with fail partnerships that's so interesting all right, I have to ask, were you the one that brought Kim Kardashian to Harvard? I was. Well, I shouldn't say I. I have two co-professors. Mm -hmm. uh, they're professors. I'm a fake professor. I'm an executive fellow. But they, uh, one of them had a relationship with uh, Jens, who's her partner. And then we did multiple calls to, you know, what are we going to talk about? Is it comfortable? Mm -hmm. And then sure enough, it happened. That's my class, though. So I, I am very impressed with what she's done. And I remember I heard about her saying like, basically, God, if I'm misquoting, I hope not. But basically, hey, ladies, like, don't let anything hold you back. Just work harder or get up and work or whatever the quote was. And when I heard it and didn't know people backlash, I was like, yes, that's so dope. And <laughs> yeah. I was like, hell don't yeah. Don't say that again. No, I have no, to have because to. I really it's believe late. it. Yeah. So uh, did you get backlash for bringing mm -hmm. Kim Kardashian? And then what do you think of what she's accomplished? Um, the answer is not enough backlash. I was not hoping, enough. I, I was hoping for more because it's entertaining because I don't care. Interesting. And I was a little annoyed that it like didn't come land. Uh, you know, it took like a few days before I was on CNBC and I was asked about it. And the reason why is she has built a multi-billion dollar yeah. business. I'm an investor actually, but that's really, not, yeah, yeah. I'm an investor in skims, but you know, congratulations. That's how, thank you. But that's, but that's beside the point. Mm. She has built an amazing business. And I love the lack of intellectual curiosity to say, well, why was she invited to Harvard? Mm. And the reason why, my course is called uh, Moving Beyond Direct-to-Consumer. And this year is every year is a sub-theme that I like to introduce that would surprise the students or like at that demographic might be slightly beyond their reach. So this year's sub-context was uh, TikTok is, is the new Google, right? Mm. Like, and that's where search begins. That was one. And two, and two that CAC, uh, on the DTC model is, is out of whack. It rhymed, I didn't mean to, but the CAC is out of whack and that acquisition costs are really expensive and a lot of DTC models are broken and they raised at these inflated valuations and they're not sustainable because now investors are demanding profitability, blah, blah, blah. So that was like the whole thing. So we brought in um, Scarlett Johansson. Uh, I'm an investor in her business and advisor. We brought in Bar Bobby, Bar Bobby Brown to demonstrate that it, somebody in their 60s could dominate uh, TikTok. And we brought in Kim Kardashian. The common thread between those three is they're all using their community and celebrity to generate subsidized CAC with mm. outrageous numbers and their businesses are printing. And so it was entertaining to watch everyone judge Kim in this very superficial way. It's now, amazing. I don't keep up with the Kardashians, literally, so I had no idea. Honestly, and at, when I saw her in that class, she was there for uh, um, almost two hours. Mm. It's not like the students hold back. You know what I mean? Watching her volley with everyone in that class and watching her hold her own with all the with all the founders was, was pretty remarkable. Mm. I was incredibly impressed. But I love those situations when you have total conviction and like you don't really care. And then I was waiting for more of the backlash, and, and uh, mm. it didn't. It, it wasn't quite intense enough. Yeah, I, I, so going back to things I'm allergic to, I don't understand people that look at somebody that's successful and look for reasons to dismiss them and why, well, that's a terrible example because X, Y, Z. Right. It's like, man. Well, not only that, if every celebrity could slap their name on the brand, they'd all be moguls, right? They'd all be billionaires. It's not, it's not easy what she did. She didn't just She's like. She's also stayed relevant for a long time. Right. Man. And when she also found an amazing uh, sliver of the market, mm. built a direct to consumer business that is valued in the, I don't know what it would be valued now, probably $5 billion. Jesus. Like, right. And, and yet there was this desire to dismiss. And now in fairness, you, you reap what you sow, right? I mean, she, I even said to her off camera, uh, this will actually probably be on the Hulu show. I was like, I don't follow you, so maybe that everyone knows this about you, but I would not have perceived you as somebody that could go in at Harvard Business School and hold your own with the best mm. found consumer founders in the country. She actually said, 
I want to show more of this of me, but when I had my show on E, they never wanted to show it. They said it was boring right. and people don't want to see me in this light. So it's admittedly, it's, it's not entertaining in that way. That's true. So I get E like they've, what they've done but I is think, amazing. But and again, it's you incredible. and I don't keep up with the Kardashians, maybe you more than me. I have a feeling as time goes by, she will become more than even a Paris Hilton figure, right? You know, Paris Hilton had her own redemption story, right? A thousand, a thousand times, times, right? Bigger. But my point is, we will see Kim Kardashian in the light of the mogul that she is, mm. and there'll be a mer- an integration. I mean, if I think. she keeps this going, God, you, you just, you can deny somebody only so long. Right. So she's winning people like me over who I'm not immersed in her world. And so I, for all I know, she's saying just absolutely atrocious things on social media, but I don't Man, think watching so. her move as a business person, I'm like, damn. But if she was sitting at the table right now, you know how we're having this intellectual mm. conversation about partnerships and bad equity structure and product, she would be keeping up with us. And yeah, I, 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 was, I was like, is this on purpose? You know, and they also didn't work very hard to get the story out in a business context mm. that, that she was coming there. So maybe I thought, oh, maybe it was like a grand plan. Man, there's an intriguing question there. Like, is right? that brand damaging that, for her? No, I think it, maybe it was all just like, we're living in a Truman show called Kim Kardashian. Mm. I don't know. Maybe it was all calculated. I don't know. So interesting. It was pretty amazing. So interesting. Dude, the book is amazing. Where can people find you? Thank I am uh I'm on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. I spent a lot of time. Uh, I can't stand Twitter. I'm there, but it's the Just land of at Matt Higgins. Land of, at Matt Higgins, land of hate. Can we talk one more before we go? Please. About um your spouse. Yeah. I I love your relationship with her. Thank you. And um I talk about my wife all the time as my basically my co-founder. And that um, I, no matter what environment I am, the uh, the the, uh, the my conditions are always I need to do it with Sarah mm. because we're better together. And so when I teach at Harvard, people don't know that Sarah's in the back of the room, and she really? does, and my wife does the logistics for the course because they're dude. They're, they're, you're playing into a thesis I have. So my wife is all about logistics; is utterly amazing. Obviously, yeah. my co-founder. Uh, yeah, we'll need a lot more time to talk about how that ends up happening, but that's amazing. Yeah. So you went through a divorce. It was utterly soul crushing by your own admission. Mm-hmm. How did you rebuild and how did you find somebody the second time that actually really fit you? I think I went online to be honest. <laughs> like I think uh, get more data was the first starting point, but I think we all, we don't believe that we are either entitled to something or that something exists. And I th- the change in my mindset was that maybe that that person does exist. That's right for me, and maybe and maybe I deserve it. People can be cliche, like I just want to thank my partner. <laughs> like I'm like no no no. <laughs> like for real. I dedicated the book to her for a reason, and it, she uh, unlocks all this potential because there's value alignment, but also there's no ego. And so the secret, my secret sauce, is that we are doing it all together in these different mm-hmm. environments, which can seem a little bit unconventional, but. Back to you guys. I admire the way you talk about each other. And I feel like by modeling it, this is the point of my story. You take care of one of the two issues that I just brought up that maybe it, maybe it doesn't exist or maybe it does exist. Mm -hmm. If somebody models that kind of dynamic, then people believe that it's out there. And so when I see you two on the internet, it's like, Oh, you're telling millions of people that it, that it exists. All right, everybody. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. Building businesses really is a skill that anyone can learn. Check out this interview with Alex Hormozzi if you want to learn how to go from being broke to making your business skyrocket. They should focus on one thing in general rather than lots of different things that you're not sure about because if you're starting out,